Yeah, good morning to everybody. Um, welcome to the third and second last lecture of this very short course. Um, um, I think I will begin by uh, asking you whether uh, there are things I've said yesterday or we said yesterday because it was a lovely, a lovely, lively and interesting conversation we had about few things. So um, let me first give you the opportunity to raise any uh, issues or uh, thoughts that you might have uh, thought about after class that you want to clarify before we move on, which moving on in this case would be just to say a few things to finish up with uh, Waldron's paper and then move to this uh, tricky business of whether democracy should be considered uh, as a human right, which is the topic of today. Um, okay, if uh, there are no pressing issues to be discussed, let me uh, <coughs> just complete what we said yesterday uh, with Waldron. You remember we distinguished these four uh, senses in which uh, one can have a foundation of human rights. <coughs> An historical one, um, sort of Kelsenian slash juridical one, in which dignity would um, operate as uh, the Brun norm in uh, Kelsen's system. Um, the third one, which is the classical way of understanding a foundation that is um, inferring from a concept uh, a, a, a or alpha um, other concepts in this case inferring from whatever we may find uh, in uh, the notion of human dignity independently uh, of how it's grounded um, the content of human rights and remember that about this third position uh, we um, distinguish between uh, a foundation that is comfortable with simply taking human dignity for granted and thinking, which would be the position itself, thinking that from uh, a non-controversial conception of human dignity you can derive human rights, and a variation of this third scheme in which uh, you also ask about the foundation of human dignity itself. So a kind of three-tiered uh, foundation in which at the bottom you have human rights, in the middle you have human dignity and uh, then you ask about the reasons why you think that humans have dignity which means to go a level above. And finally the form of foundation, the fourth and four, the fourth and final uh, form that Waldron seems to prefer, uh, in which there is no hierarchical, uh, vertical uh, structure between human rights and human dignity, remember, um, sorry, human dignity, right, but you rather have this horizontal scheme in which human dignity operates as a sort of a unifying idea, organizing idea that on the one hand makes sense of uh, the human rights that we have, so uh, you, you could think of it as a sort of answer to the skeptic that says, wait, why do we have exactly these human rights and not others? And the answer could be, well, you find in here only those rights that guarantee that human dignity is taken into consideration. Um, this would not be this scheme because the existence of this right is not a consequence of the existence of human dignity, but it's rather the case that human dignity is what gives uh, a coherence to the body of human rights that we have. It explains, among other things, why we have those rights and not other rights. Okay? And the other function that uh, in this scheme, uh, uh, foundational scheme preferred by Waldron, remember the other function would be this dialectic between the two concepts. <coughs> 
since both are a sort of a work in progress, that we can adjust one by <coughs> knowing something more about the other. So you can imagine, you know, a convincing new philosophical theory about human dignity that is going to impact on the kind of human rights that we have. That would be this arrow. You may think of an evolution of human rights <coughs> generated by activism or by the insurgence of new needs and of a new consensus, world consensus on the necessity to move, who knows, to a fifth generation of human rights. Uh, at that point, the new rights that we find here might influence and change our conception of human dignity. Now, the last thing I want to say about Waldron has to do with his conception, which I confess uh, don't understand very well, so perhaps you can help me, uh, when he says that, I mean, this refers back to the book uh, I was mentioning uh, yesterday, Dignity, uh, Ranks and Status, uh, that Waldron writes in 2012. Um, because in his opinion, uh, dignity should not be considered as a value, uh, like with Kant, for example. I mean, it's a value that is grounded in, in our autonomy, in, on, it's grounded in the fact that we are the only beings capable of moral behavior. So it's, it is a value because it's the value that humanity has. It's exactly the essence of human worth. Uh, for uh, Waldron, this is not the correct way of conceiving of dignity because instead of a value, we should conceive of it as a status. He says here, um, page 133, sometimes it is said correctly in my view that dignity is a status concept, not a value concept. If we think carefully about status, it may seem that this opens up yet another possibility for a mistake about dignity's alleged foundational role. So in law, a status is a particular package of rights, powers, disabilities, duties, privileges, immunities and liabilities accruing to a person by virtue of the condition or situation they are in. So bankruptcy, infancy, royalty, being an alien, being a prisoner, being a member of the armed forces, being married, all these are conditions that entitle you to a status. And with this status come a set of rights that other people don't have. Now, as far as I understand, which again could be mistaken and simplistic, the big idea that Waldron has is to conceive of human rights, uh, sorry, um, of human dignity as a status that all human beings have, as opposed to say, okay, only infants, only members of the armed force, only those who have gone into bankruptcy and so on and so forth. Uh, dignity has to be conceived as a status that all humans have. But at this point, as he himself recognizes, human dignity becomes the abbreviation for the list of rights, uh, powers that uh, people uh, have. So um, it seems that um, he wants to say that all that human dignity does for us is to be a placeholder, a sort of shortened name for human rights, um, or at least for the condition that entitles us to a certain set of rights, um, without adding uh, much more information to that. In fact, uh, he continues by saying, it can easily appear that the status term does not introduce any new information. John Austin thought this as he wrote in the lectures on jurisprudence, the sets of rights and duties or of capacities and incapacities inserted as status in the law of persons are placed there merely for the sake of commodities exposition, for, for the sake of a easier and most, more straightforward exposition. A status term, he said, is an ellipsis or an abridged form of expression purely a matter of expository convenience. It is nothing but, a, 
but an abbreviation, a device of legal exegetics. And then he continues, if all this is true and if dignity is a status, then it would be a mistake, a sort of category mistake, to talk of dignity as the foundations of rights. So he denies that in a sense there is intellectual advantage in thinking of dignity as the foundation of human rights because it's not a value, it's just a short name for the condition that entitles us to have human rights. Or perhaps even more uh, clearly, it's a short name for human rights themselves. We may say instead of thinking of dignity as the foundation of human rights, the vertical model that you have up there, uh, we may say that dignity is a status that comprises a given set of rights. The old notion of dignitas was like this. The dignitas of a noble man, of a noble man yes, was a different status from the dignitas of a priest and the difference consisted simply in the detail of the rights associated respectively with the status of nobility and the status of being in holy orders. So what is the difference between the dignitas of a priest and the dignitas of uh, a nobleman in, uh, in uh, European Middle Age? Uh, according to Waldron, is simply the difference in rights that priests and noblemen enjoy. Okay, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced by this line of thought at all. In fact, even the analogy that, that Waldron gives shows that it's flawed by uh, serious mistakes because it's not true that the, all there is in the difference between the dignitas of a priest and the dignitas of a nobleman is the difference in rights. I mean, the dignitas, even in those cases, even in the example that he gives, points to a different condition that the priest has and that the nobleman has, points to the ground that entitles the nobleman to a certain set of rights, as opposed to the rights that the priest is entitled to in virtue of a different ground that the name dignitas refers to. So. Um, Reducing uh, dignitas, even in those cases, to simply a short name for the rights that the person who has that dignity enjoys uh, is a category mistake. Uh, and uh, of course, this is also true, uh, in my opinion, when we talk about the relation between human dignity and human rights. Human dignity is not a just a placeholder or a short name for human rights points to the ground quite uh, straightforwardly and uh, like our intuition suggests, it points to the ground why we have those rights. It's not just a cap turn or something like that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about, of course then he talks about a little bit the grounds of dignity, he says that there are many different grounds of dignities. Um, um, and that there is no way to find consensus or unanimity about uh, the grounds of this concept. Okay, so unless you want to comment something on it, unless you want me to say that uh, I am too harsh to Waldron, I'm too quick, too simplistic, or whatever uh, you may uh, think of it, I would uh, move to today's topic. Okay, well then, uh, let's go on. The topic that we have today is the relation between uh, human rights and democracy. And uh, as I've already mentioned uh, uh, repeatedly in the first two lectures, there is a fairly interesting debate um, in the last 20 years on, on whether uh, we should um, conceive of uh, democracy as a human rights. Um, the sort of antecedent uh, to the present debate is again uh, the sketchy theory that John Rawls gives us uh, of human rights in, in the law of peoples. Um, as I told you, um, 
wants uh, devotes a couple of pages to human rights, nothing more than that in that book, in which basically he tells us that uh, human rights should be conceived according to the political interpretation. They are nothing but those things that limit a national sovereignty, remember, and precisely for this reason they cannot be conceived to broadly, too ambitiously, uh, and they should be conceived as something less demanding, less uh, ambitious than uh, the list of rights that we find in liberal democracy, including, <coughs> of course, perfect equality uh, uh, among citizens. So, you are not in a democratic country unless you are not treated at least in terms of formal liberties and rights exactly like anyone else. Uh, if there is a group of citizens that enjoys some rights less than you, not because, I don't know, you committed a crime or just, you know, as a default position, uh, women enjoying less rights than men, blacks enjoying less, white, less rights than, than, uh, than um, white, and so on and so forth. Of course, we would not conceive that uh, <coughs> as a democracy. Now, Rhodes' point is that we have to be a little bit tolerant with some discriminations that may occur in uh, uh, countries. Um, and in order to be tolerant with uh, discrimination, for example, in uh, assigning not to everybody exactly the same political rights, like in his famous decent peoples that, as you know, have a, a hierarchical form of consultation but do not concede to each citizen the same power to shape the uh, political decisions that are made in that country. Uh, since we want to be tolerant to this uh, you know, kind of soft form of discrimination, we should be careful not to include in the list of human rights democracy. Because at that point, if we did include democracy, we would be forced to say that the national sovereignty of those countries with some discrimination here and there would be in danger. Um, so, not accidentally, uh, Rawls has a shortened list of human rights, he calls it basic human rights that have to do with the integrity of the person, protection of personal property, uh, civic rights, so for example for him is important for the decency, if not a justice of a political system that people are free to protest against the government, even if they are not uh, given an equal chance to influence the government, at least they have to be able to protest against this government, um, and, uh, you know, rights uh, uh, of a free trial, free and uh, be considered equal before the law, be considered equal before the law. Now, um, this intuition, I, I told you a couple of pages in the Law of Peoples, which was very influential because it's really the, the birth of the political interpretation of human rights, if you want, is the starting point of the political interpretation, um, was further developed by Joshua Cohen, who is one of uh, the students of John Rawls. As you know, in those years, Rawls had pretty good students, Thomas, Thomas Bogge, Joshua Cohen, um, Honor O'Neill, it's, it's a preceding uh, generation. Um, Thomas Hill and uh, other influential philosophers. I mean, some people think that there is a Rawlsian left and a Rawlsian right, like with Hegel, um, and the left would be Bog uh, by its, uh, uh, these people, and the right would be Joshua Cohen. I mean, these are liberal thinkers, right, in a very uh, comparative way, but um, I mean, Bogge is a cosmopolitan, uh, Joshua Bowen is not, pretty much like Rawls was not a cosmopolitan thinker, as you know. 
Um, anyway, yeah, besides this left and right, um, we focus a little bit on, on Joshua Bowen here because he develops this uh, intuition, uh, this sketchy theory that we find in the law of peoples. And uh, development is, to begin with, uh, to spell out the first consequence from, that follows from the approach that holds takes and has to do with the idea that democracy should not be considered as a human right for the reason that I'm giving you and for extra reasons that Cohen spells out and that I want to summarize um, uh, in the first part of the class to move then to uh, Cristiano's take on this. Okay, so what is the big idea uh, behind this rejection uh, of democracy uh, as a human rights? Well, uh, I guess that the most fundamental reason has to do with the tension between these two values that I put down on the board, self-determination and democracy. Now let's see if someone can tell me why self-determination could be in tension with democracy. Self-determination, uh, I'm giving you a hint, not of individuals, but of peoples. Why, I mean, you may think, wait a minute, democracy is the quintessential self-determination of peoples, right? It's exactly when the people uh, can decide uh, about the political <coughs> destiny uh, of their country. So, in what sense could self-determination be in tension with, the, with democracy? Well, yeah. Because if you consider self-determination as a power to decide in which way uh, a group wants to live, it could include which sort of government it should um, choose. Which includes also the possibility to choose a non-democratic yes. form of government. So that's the intuition. Precisely, yes. So, self-determination of the people seems to be a more basic right because it at least opens up the possibility that the people uh, decides not to be wanted, not to be uh, ruled by a, a, a government that is chosen in a democratic form. This may sound uh, at least a little bit abstract, in a sense it is abstract, we'll see that later on, uh, but it is undeniable that at least at a logical level it is true that there is the chance that a people decides that democracy is not the best form of government. Uh, for a, a number of reasons, you may start with a merely instrumental uh, conception of democracy, which would be democracy is as good as the goods that it brings, if it's, you know, if experience tells us that democracy produces injustice, that democracy is, uh, you know, has an intrinsic tendency toward populism, that in the end it's a mere uh, illusion that the people rules because it's just an elite of extremely wealthy people that control, you know, the, the point of Occupy Wall Street and, you know, what, what's happening in the Western world now with populism. I mean, at, at one point, the people may say, you know, uh, democracy is only a good to the extent in which it produces good political outcomes. If we know that this is no longer the case, maybe it used to be the case, but if it's no longer the case, we should choose some different form of government. I mean, I told you about the Chinese case. My friend and colleague, Daniel Bell, who lives, teaches, in Beijing, wrote this uh, book by um, Princeton University Press called The China Model, uh, in which he seriously challenges democracy as the best form of government, uh, saying that the selection-based uh, approach uh, that they have in China for political leaders, so the idea that political leaders should be selected and not elected, is to be given at least uh, more attention than it's usually 
uh, conceded because what would we think about the Chinese political system? It's a dictatorship, it's a great uh, a human rights abuser, uh, it's something that has to be overcome in time when they will understand that democracy is the only destiny and it's the best thing and so on and so forth. I guess that's pretty much what we all think. And his point is, wait a minute, I mean, um, there are uh, advantages in having leaders that are selected uh, not perfectly, he recognizes, but at least some of the times according to two main criteria. One, their intellectual capacity. So think about having politicians that are old, smart. <laughs> that would be already an achievement. Uh, and two, uh, their moral uh, record. So uh, have they uh, committed any crime in terms of stealing public money when they were administering a certain city? Have, uh, have they shown an ability to uh, use public money in the proper way without wasting and, and so on and so forth? Uh, if they did at a certain level of government, that they are promoted at a higher level of government. And this is a fairly you know, established system of exams of, you know, like being promoted to a different position in the university. It's pretty much the same structure. And, um, and when you make it to the, to the Politburo now, it, it's not the, the right name, but uh, to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, you have gone through a series of selection that it's much worse than making it to being the Dean of Harvard. So, um, I mean, uh, I'm not convinced completely, in fact, I, I, I replied publicly to, to Daniel Bell on this point, but I'm, I'm trying to say that there is room to conceive of the possibility that the people might not choose willingly uh, a democratic form of government. If that is the case, says Cohen, then uh, we have to decide whether we want to insert in the human rights that we have the value of self-determination or the value of democracy. Uh, because if we put a human right to democracy, then we would be saying that we want to, uh, we don't want to respect the choice of these putative people that uh, wants to be ruled by a non-democratic form of government. So we would be saying by including democracy in the list of human rights that we are entitled and to a certain extent obliged to criticize these people for its non-democratic choice. Okay? And Cohen says this is counterintuitive. I mean, the, the value of self-determination is stronger. I mean, if a people decides that does not like democracy, who am I from outside of the people, the international community, to say, no, no, you, you made the wrong choice. I'm, go I'm going to tell you the way in which you, you should be ruled. So that's, that's the intuition. Interestingly, I have to add, Cohen... Um, makes two further um, points to show that instead of democracy, we should include uh, in the list of human rights what he calls a human right to membership. Now, when Rhodes and Cohen and, all, and these political thinkers um, say that they do, want, do not want to include democracy in the list of human rights, that does not mean that anything goes and uh, if there is a dictatorship, a brutal dictatorship, that should not be a concern for human rights. No. Their point is that we have to find a middle ground between uh, the absolute worst, North Korea, and, uh, I don't know, you pick the best political system we have in in this war today, uh, usually it's the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, I don't know, Germany, who knows, I mean, it depends. Okay, so 
There must be something in between, and the something in between for Rhodes are the decent people. And the decent people are not dictatorship, brutal dictatorships, but are political systems, as I have already said, in which uh, the famous basic human rights are respected, so, you know, private property is respected, nobody uh, is shot by the police without, you know, some serious reason, so physical integrity, um, uh, everybody has the right to protest against the decision of the government, uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you are before uh, a court, you are treated uh, as equal to anybody else. So there is some rule of law, there are basic human rights respected. What is missing compared to a liberal democracy is the fact that people are considered as equal, at least in political rights, because not everybody has one vote, you know, uh, the principle of one head, one vote is not respected. There is what Rhodes calls the hierarchical consultation structure, which means that minorities are represented in the parliament, but perhaps having one representative for each minority, independently of the number of uh, members of that minority, um, and in addition, there must be uh, in the, for the government the duty to justify its decision in terms of uh, an attempt to pursue the public good. So these are decent people, right? So decent people are this middle point between the absolute worst and the best, which would be liberal democracy. Uh, they are decent in the English sense of the word, not okay. Uh, decente, at least in Italian, means okay, you're not too bad. Decent means morally acceptable, morally um, respectable. Um, and uh, they are so because, in addition to uh, respecting these basic human rights, they have uh, a form of selection of the elite, of political leaders that is not democratic but it's not arbitrary either, right? So that's why it's a consultation strategy. Okay, so Cohen says, in, before this kind of governments, we should be tolerant. Uh, to begin with, for, because we think our intuitions tell us that the value of self-determination is stronger than the value of the democracy. Because it would be strange that from the outside we tell a self-determining people the way in which it should determine itself. Uh, the other reason that he gives has to do with political obligation. Okay, so self-determination is, in a sense, the first reason that he has. The second reason has to do with the notion of political obligation. Uh, I'm talking about a paper called the Is There a Human Right to Democracy that appeared in 2006. Now, political obligation, here the intuition is quite straightforward. So imagine that I think I've already mentioned this. Imagine that in a democracy, uh, our government makes a decision that we think, and the majority of people in that democracy thinks, that are wrong or even morally dubious. Uh, do we have a right to disobey to our government simply because it passes a law or makes a decision that many people and even most people at a certain point in time believe that it's not correct and possibly morally wrong. And Cohen obviously says, of course we don't have a right to disobey because it's in the logic of political obligation that once you have elected a government for a certain period of time at least, you have to obey 
even if you don't like what the government does, otherwise it's the end of everything. I mean, if we can disobey um, uh, our government elected in the, in the right way through the procedures that we have uh, decided to adopt and so on and so forth, simply because it commits a mistake, that we think it commits a mistake, then there is no longer any sense of uh, order or uh, political obligation in the society, right? Okay, so that's the, the, the premise of the, argument, of the argument is keep in mind that sometimes we are asked, even in liberal democracy, to tolerate decisions that we think are immoral. If that is the case, a fortiori, we should be very wary, we should be very careful to uh, be intolerant toward decisions that governments of other countries make. So, the idea here is that if we think from the perspective uh, of our country, uh, with our values, that certain values that are practiced, certain decisions, certain laws, certain constitutional features that we find in different countries are not um, in line with our moral intuition, we should be certainly more tolerant than what we are uh, when it comes to tolerate the decision of our own government. So, uh, the point about political obligation is really uh, a point about uh, the necessity of tolerating uh, injustice um, in uh, happening in other countries uh, for a reason uh, that has to do with the fact that sometimes we tolerate injustice also within our country. And the third reason that he has, well, not surprisingly, has to do with toleration. We need to be tolerant. I mean, how tolerant should we be in our polity, in our own country? Well, uh, sometimes people think that uh, the only thing we are not supposed to tolerate are intolerant people that put in danger the structure of the society in which everybody can express his or her views uh, freely and try to influence the uh, political decision process. So if you have violent people, people who say, uh, oh, you know, if I go to the government, I will uh, in initiate a dictatorship, um, then uh, the famous paradox of democracy, uh, one thing that the democracy has the right to rule out from political competition, from the bound of legality, uh, someone who professes these ideas. So we have to be tolerant as much as possible, but we should be careful not to be tolerant towards those who say, if I get political power, I will establish political authority that is not tolerant. Um, well, again, Cohen's intuition here is that Cohen's uh, suggestion is, okay, now, now let's think about how tolerant we should be not inside our country, but in, towards political uh, realities that are outside of our countries. And the idea is that we should be more tolerant than what we are inside. So, if there are cases of not genocide, of course, again, we are not talking about brutal dictatorships, but if we are talking about political systems in which certain things that for us are very important, perfect equality of all citizens, the fact that it's not possible simply because you are a woman, you are not allowed to vote, 
this would be utterly unacceptable for us. But the point is, should we tolerate a political system in which women do not vote outside, you know, in, uh, in a country that has a different political uh, uh, tradition, uh, different values, perhaps different religions, or different interpretations of it, uh, its own religion, and so on and so forth. And, you know, Cohen says, yes, we should tolerate. Uh, things that we do not tolerate within our borders. I guess, again, in virtue of the overarching value of self-determination, always this idea of who am I to tell you, you and other people, how to organize your political life. Uh, well, I wrote an article to reply to each of these three ideas uh, and I don't want to impose on you uh, the details of this response. I wrote an article in 2012 that appeared in the Routledge Handbook of Human Rights. Um, basically, uh, I contest the idea that when Cohen talks about self-determination, he imagines that there is one entity that determines itself, the foreign society we imagine, that people, that country over there. I mean, wait a minute, self-determination, we have to be careful who is the self in that determines itself, right? Because sometimes it's not the people, it's the elite of that people that decides not to be democratic for very straightforward reason, because they are in power. So they don't want to go uh, under the judgment of the of the society, so that's China case. It's China. China case. Ah, well, if my friend Daniel is right, it's not that clear. And I've been to China many times. I made this, I mean, insignificant political experiment, asking students whether no, no, not even asking. Actually, I was lecturing, and there was the presupposition that, of course, democracy was the best political system. And at one point, I got a question. Said, Look, we don't care about democracy here. But to begin with, elections are expensive. Uh, and then we know that there is a lot of corruption going on in, uh, in uh, you know, we are pretty happy with the government that we have. Now, if, if it was a sort of, you know, an agent of the, of the Communist Party that was sent there, in fact, there was one. But, but was, I knew there was one, but I'm certain it was not that guy. Um, but it is certainly the case that the value of democracy is less resonant in the Chinese context than it is now. My point would be, even if it's not as popular as it is in the Western world, it's pre probably the case that there is a consistent section of the population that would like to be treated as equal that would like to choose this form of government. So what do we do with them? Shouldn't we give priority to the human rights of those people instead of respecting China? Uh, shouldn't we think in, term, in individualistic terms and say, okay, I, I don't care whether China determines itself toward, toward non-democracy. I, I care about the Chinese people who want to have uh, their rights uh, treated uh, in a certain, I mean, uh, respected in a certain way. So, okay, so that's what I would say against the value of, of self-determination, against the, this point about political obligation. Yes, it's, it's true that sometimes we, did, we are bound to obey decisions of our government that um, we consider as immoral, but at least we know that that government was elected through the right procedures. I mean, we accept this as a fact of normal life in, uh, in democracy. Sometimes governments make mistakes in good faith, in bad faith. It doesn't matter as long as we accept the rules of the game that every four or five years we elect our parliament and therefore our government. It's not the case that two years later we can say, oh no, you know, I changed my mind. Now you, are, you no longer have political authority doesn't work like that. These were not the rules we agreed to 
before. Okay, that's true, I, I tell Cohen, but it's very different from being asked to accept an immoral decision that is taken by a government you have not chosen, which would be the case in a non-democratic country, right? So, the analogy here is very uh, flawed, I mean, um, with difficulties, because it is one thing to accept a decision by, taken by a government that you know was chosen by the people uh, and uh, elected through the procedures that you have accepted. And it's a completely different thing to accept a decision taken by a government that, that by definition was not chosen and that uh, there is no guarantee that the people uh, considered as legitimate, as it would be in the case of non-democratic societies. And, you know, about the point of toleration, uh, uh, very uh, simply, I doubt that we should tolerate a system in which, uh, for example, half of the population, women often, uh, uh, are not given the right to vote. I mean, is it really enough uh, that uh, people are not killed 